It is the business of the Negro not to sit idly by and see this rearrangement of the world, hoping that something good will come out of it for him. It is rather his business actually to put himself into the turmoil and work effectively for a new democracy that shall know no color. W.E.B. Du Bois, The Crisis. The shots that killed Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary on June 28, 1914, sparked the bloodiest war in world history. For Europeans, the Great War was an unmitigated disaster that wiped out a generation of young men, took millions of civilian lives, and ruined empires and nations alike. Across the Atlantic, the American people faced a less brutal wartime experience. At the beginning of the conflict, President Woodrow Wilson declared that the United States would be a neutral nation, a position that endured for two and a half years as American businesses prospered from a flood of European military orders. Later, when the United States joined the war in April 1917, American soldiers fought abroad, suffering relatively few casualties in the last months of combat. In November 1918, when the armistice was signed, ending the fighting, the United States emerged from the conflict stronger than before, with no wartime destruction or serious economic damage. Despite the short duration of the American war effort, the conflict affected the nation in deep and profound ways. In one of the most important areas of change, the war opened up many new opportunities for African Americans, who embraced President Wilson's war to make the world safe for democracy in hopes that their loyal service would provide a way to challenge both racial discrimination at home and colonial oppression of Africans abroad. Perhaps the most obvious effect of the First World War on African Americans was the movement of thousands of blacks from the South to the North. Drawn by wartime jobs and other opportunities, 330,000 African Americans left the rural South for new homes in Detroit, Philadelphia, Chicago, New York, and dozens of other northern cities. With thousands of men called up for the draft and the virtual end of European immigration during the war period, northern industries faced an acute labor shortage. Labor was needed in railroad construction, steel mills, packing houses, foundries, and automobile plants. Employers who had previously refused to hire blacks because of racial discrimination now opened their doors to this eager group of laborers and, at least for a brief moment, blacks entered a new, high-skilled jobs of their choosing. There was also a political dimension to the Great Migration. As African Americans moved north, they hoped to escape the lynching, segregation, and disfranchisement that had plagued them in the South. By moving north, blacks were voting with their feet for a more egalitarian and democratic life. When President Wilson issued his call for a declaration of war against Germany in April 1917, he told Congress and the American people that the United States must fight against the autocratic imperial powers of Europe to make the world safe for democracy. African Americans quickly appropriated Wilson's idealistic rhetoric to press for change both at home and abroad. Emboldened by the president's call for global democracy, black newspaper editors, preachers, and public intellectuals called on the nation's white establishment to offer African Americans better conditions in public facilities, greater employment opportunities, and an immediate end to lynching. The Reverend Adam Clayton Powell of Obsidian Baptist Church in New York City's Harlem neighborhood expressed the black mood well when he said, While we love our flag and our country, we do not believe in fighting for the protection of commerce on the high seas until the powers that be give us at least some verbal assurance that the property and lives of the members of our race are going to be protected on land from Maine to Mississippi. 
let us have the courage to say to the white people of America, give us the same rights which you enjoy, and then we will fight by your side with all our might for every international right on land and sea. Thousands of African Americans shared Adam Clayton Powell's bold new perspective, and many joined the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People to pressure for change. The organization, known as the NAACP, had only 54 local branches in 1914, but grew tremendously during the war, reaching 310 branches by 1919. One of the NAACP's most well-known campaigns during the war focused on the derogatory racial stereotypes put forward in D.W. Griffith's infamous film, The Birth of a Nation. The NAACP called for a national boycott of the film, which portrayed black men as lascivious, ignorant buffoons who posed a danger to white womanhood and good government. Although the NAACP failed to close Birth of a Nation, the organization and its chairman, Joel Spingern, had more success in securing a training camp for black officers in 1917. Although blacks had fought with distinction in every war in American history, most white Southerners opposed the creation of a black officer corps. Many whites believed that military experience made black men more assertive and courageous two traits that posed a serious danger to racial segregation. In the end, Spinger won the battle, and the government created a black-only officer training camp at Des Moines, Iowa, in June 1917. Over 2,000 men were trained at the camp, and they soon took their place as leaders in the American military. In addition, well over 2 million black men registered with the local draft boards for the war, and 367,000 were conscripted into the army. Isolated in Harlem and inspired by the changes taking place around him, W.E.B. Du Bois, the editor of the NAACP's Crisis magazine, called on African Americans to give their unconditional support to the war in 1917. That December, he noted that, from now on, we may expect to see the walls of prejudice gradually crumble before the onslaught of common sense and racial progress. Then, in July 1918, he went even further, asking blacks to Forget our special grievances and close ranks behind the war effort. We want victory for ourselves, but it must not be cheap bargaining. It must be clean and glorious, won by our own manliness and not by the threat of the footpad. Du Bois's call to close ranks quickly came back to haunt him. Black Americans soon discovered that the wartime spirit of patriotic cooperation was utterly superficial, and that whites of all classes were determined to keep blacks in their place. Whites accepted black participation in the war effort but only on Jim Crow, segregated terms. Rather than bringing about change, the forces unleashed by the war, black migration, black militancy, and black military service, provoked a violent white backlash. The worst violence occurred in East St. Louis, Illinois, where some 470 African Americans had been hired to replace white workers who had gone on strike against the aluminum ore company in February 1917. As tensions seethed, news of an attempted robbery by a black man set off a riot on May 28. White mobs rampaged through town, pulling blacks off of streetcars, beating them, and forcing the Illinois governor to call out the National Guard. Yet the May 28th disturbances were only a prelude to the violence that erupted on July 2nd, 1917, when white mobs again went on the rampage. At 6 o'clock that night, mobs set fire to black homes and beat and killed dozens of black men, 
women, and children. Again, the National Guard returned, but the damage was done. In response to the rioting, the NAACP published an investigative report and sponsored a silent protest march with thousands of African Americans marching down Fifth Avenue in New York City in opposition to the violence. Another organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, also took action after the riot. On July 8, 1917, the UNIA's president, Marcus Garvey, said, This is a crime against the laws of humanity. It is a crime against the laws of the nation. It is a crime against nature and a crime against the God of all mankind. A year later, a United States House of Representatives special committee found that the National Guard and local police force had not acted adequately during the East St. Louis riots, revealing that the police often fled from the scenes of murder and arson. In fact, the investigation resulted in the indictment of several members of the East St. Louis police force. A few weeks after the East St. Louis riot, 156 black soldiers and the 24th U.S. Infantry stationed at Camp Logan, Texas, attacked the white community in Houston for subjecting them to Jim Crow segregation and humiliating treatment. The Houston rioters were led by Corporal Charles Baltimore, who had been beaten by a white policeman early on August 23, 1917. That afternoon, Baltimore led a contingent of troops into Houston, where they opened fire on the police station. The troops killed five policemen and several other white people. Two black soldiers were also killed. Later, in a report on the incident, Martha Gruning of the NAACP wrote that the primary cause of the Houston riot was the habitual brutality of the white police officers in their treatment of colored people. The federal government did not agree with Ms. Gruning's conclusions, however. It quickly carried out the largest court-martial in American history and executed 19 soldiers for mutiny and murder. After an outcry over the hasty executions, however, President Wilson commuted many of the other death sentences. In the end, the Army privately admitted that the ultimate cause of the riot was the resolve of black troops to assert what they believed to be their rights as American citizens and United States soldiers. Black troops in France faced many of the same problems that white soldiers encountered. They were green troops with poor equipment, inexperienced leadership, and little training for modern warfare against the battle-hardened German army that had mastered trench warfare on the Western Front. After several months of panic and confusion, however, American forces developed and made their way into battle. African Americans received little praise or honor for their heroic service. White soldiers belittled them, and the military placed 80% of the black conscripts into labor battalions accounting for a full third of all the army's pick and shovel workers. The army not only exported white supremacy to France, but it worked to convince the French to practice racial segregation too. In a leaflet entitled Secret Information Concerning Black American Troops, the army explained that white Americans believed segregation was necessary to avert the menace of degeneracy. In addition, the leaflet warned that French soldiers should refrain from commending black soldiers too highly lest they risk spoiling the Negroes. Enraged by the discrimination blacks encountered during the war, W.E.B. Du Bois took to the pages of the crisis in May of 1919 to redeem his radical credentials. The faults of our country are our faults. Under similar circumstances, we would fight again. But, by the God of heaven, 
We are cowards and jackasses. If now that the war is over, we do not marshal every ounce of our brain and brawn to fight a sterner, longer, more unbending battle against the forces of hell in our own land. We return. We return from fighting. We return fighting. Make way for democracy. We saved it in France and by the great Jehovah. We will save it in the United States of America or know the reason why. It was presumptuous of Du Bois to speak on behalf of black veterans, but his words certainly summarized the mood of many men. For example, when Charles Hamilton Houston returned to America after the war, he was determined to fight for equal rights at home. Houston soon became a prominent African-American attorney, dean of the Howard Law School, and director of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that challenged Jim Crow in the courts. His wartime experience was crucial to his lifelong effort to achieve greater opportunities for his people. African American soldiers had experienced greater equality in Europe during the war than they did at home. Blacks ate in the same restaurants as whites, they used the same public facilities as whites, and they rode in the same public transportation as whites. As African American soldiers returned from the war, they struggled to achieve a new level of equality in their own land. The black author and activist James Weldon Johnson called the summer of 1919 the Red Summer for the blood that flowed in the streets as a series of race riots broke out in 25 American cities, including Washington, Knoxville, and Omaha. Black soldiers were the primary targets of white violence. These uppity blacks threatened white jobs, and more importantly, their assertiveness threatened the pre-war order that whites had created. Although the race riots in the summer of 1919 were terrible, the Great Migration to the North was not abated. Between 1920 and 1930, 872,000 African Americans moved out of the South to northern cities. The stage was set for the New Negro and the Harlem Renaissance.